Let's take a look at the book of Esther for a while. These, all these lessons are really lessons on faith, and I want you to know that. I think it's, it's easier to learn about faith when you see it developed in real people like you and I. Although it seems like you know, that we don't have much in common with Esther, uh, we do. A uh, human being just like we are, and uh, capable of a lot, and, uh, and we are just like her in that respect. But tonight I want us, this is, this is an introduction to a topic, not necessarily the text itself. We'll get into that next time. And I wanted to look at the, the connection of faith and taking risks. Faith and taking risks. Esther teaches us to do hard things and to take risks uh, when we must take risks. Taking risks for the most important things and that is for the good of people. Now, um, I, in, in looking at all this, I, I, I read a couple of things, a couple of articles and blogs that I, that I wanted to share with you because they, uh, these, uh, these two men uh, came up with some really good ideas and I always like to cite when I, when I use something in a sermon like this. And this interesting article I uh, read recently was from preachingtoday.com. Actually, it's a very good, very good periodical about the art, the science, uh, and the work of preaching. And, but the, serm, the, the article was called The Gospel According to Esther. Now, of course, it talks nothing about Jesus, and, and that's not its purpose. Uh, but the good news, I would, you, know, you could put in there, the good news according to Esther. And actually, the article was about preaching skills. And let me try, I'll try to tie it into our, our topic in this way. The writer, a man named Herschel York, challenged preachers, challenged me as I read it, to preach the whole Bible, all of it, 66 books, preach it all. Uh, and, and, and that type of, of preaching obviously gives us the whole picture. Uh, even though we um, are, are, are known as being people who take New Testament Christianity seriously, obviously God's revelation uh, goes from the beginning uh, to the end of the revelation. And we need to preach on, on everything in the Bible. And so preaching the whole Bible, though, brings up a number of challenges. And not just it's a lot to cover or that it's a, a lot to uh, get into, a lot to learn, a lot to study. Uh, and it takes a long time to actually go through um, a, a, a front-to-back um, study of the Bible. But there are certain parts of the Bible that make us nervous. i got to tell you that's true. There are certain parts of the Bible that when we read them, we can be nervous. They can be so challenging to us that we like to read it. Okay, I did my due diligence, and I'm going to flip pretty quickly because it's, uh, man, that just that convicts me perhaps. Or there are certain things that, uh, that, we, that are touchy subjects and, and of course, ne never wanting to offend or, or be embarrassed. You don't want to see me completely red-faced as I, as I preach to you from the Song of Solomon course I'll have to do that now I said that I can't skip it which uh, I, I don't know I was thinking I'd leave it for Dan to preach sometime brother so anyway it, it's uh, it's challenging in that so certain parts make us nervous and I just wanted to tell you that it, that's totally true but the writer reminded me something that you and I preachers teachers people of the word we already know this second Timothy 2 or second Timothy 3 rather 316 where the word says, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And York reminded me with that passage right there in reminding preachers to ask certain questions about the passages that we, that we um, will go through and preach to the churches. In other words, there are three questions he suggests. Number one, what did the story mean in its original context? Before I, we look at anything else, what does, this, what does the text stay, say? How did they understand it when they heard the text? That's always the first consideration. The second uh, uh, consideration is how does it relate to God's revelation about Jesus? The story of Jesus is the story of the Bible. From Genesis to Revelation, it is all about the coming and the arriving and then the life of Jesus Christ. And even, uh, you know, a story that was written 
and began to be written before God said, let there be light. Ephesians 1 tells us that. So that's, that's another consideration. But the third consideration is how does it apply to the lives of people today? Now, now here's, here's my point. His case study for, for learning these lessons about preparing sermons, his lesson, his object lesson, or case study rather, was the story of Esther. And I thought that, that was, that's how I came across this. And I thought that was very, very interesting. Why would you give a case study about preaching to one of the, if you'll forgive me, one of the more obscure um, writings in the Bible? It really is. Not um, everybody knows about the story um, of Esther. Esther is a real challenge to preach, let me tell you. Uh, the way it's laid out, what it talks about, but more, the things that make you nervous are the things that it doesn't talk about, all right? And so what's important about that? Uh, and uh, let, me, let me give you some things that, that can make a preacher nervous. Well, generally, the story of Esther, kind of like the story of, of Ruth, is not the usual domain of the preacher. It's usually owned by women's ministry and by ladies' Bible class. Y'all love Esther, and you love Ruth, and I, and I think that's wonderful. Uh, but uh, so in that setting right there, you'll never hear at men's retreat us talking about Esther. It's just, it's not going to happen unless you want to marry a fine-looking woman, guys. I mean, that's not the, the only thing I can think of. Now, 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 the point is, is that we don't feel that we own certain things, and that's one, that's, that's one truth. Another truth uh, that needs to be mentioned is that t uh, preachers, teachers, moms and dads and Bible school teachers, that we tend to run away from um, a text like Esther because of the certain uh, challenges that we find. First of all, the author never mentions God at all. Now it's in the Bible. Now what's the lesson I'm going to give about God when God is alluded to now? but not mentioned the way it would have been in other writings, perhaps. You see fasting, but you don't see prayer. Esther, instead of, of unabashedly living out her, her Jewishness, hides that really just covers over the fact of who she is and doesn't uh, make that um, a, a big point uh, to make. And then one of, the, one of the more troubling ones. Now, get, you know, we call her queen. Yes, queen, uh, but she was more than a queen, and it wasn't quite as queenly as we make it sound uh, in our modern, uh, modern understanding of being a queen. She basically spends her nights in romantic relations with the pagan king. That's Queen Esther. Now, that would make me nervous as I read this to my little girl. All right? Now, but here's some other things to remember. There is a book in the Bible that no one has a problem with. Everyone loves it. There is no problem. Even though both Esther and this book are both set during the same time period in the exile of Israel into captivity, both these writers, uh, <coughs> writings and the main characters in these writings, they both serve in a royal court serving a pagan king. Both of them have the salvation of Israel, its people, its culture, and its God as the, as the center of the story. And uh, the two principal characters, what we see is both of them risked everything. They risked everything in their life. Now, of course, if you haven't figured it out yet, I'm comparing Esther to the book of Daniel. Why do we have a problem with Esther? And we have no problem with Daniel. Now, the point I want to make is simply that Daniel and Esther were willing to risk their lives for God and willing to risk their lives for the good of God's people. And so if we are going to be people of faith, we also have to accept the risks and the challenges of honoring our God and fighting for His Word and the truth about Him and helping, saving, serving, and blessing people as a part of our very lives, no matter what it costs. That's why I entitled the lesson uh, the way I did about risking everything. That is the point 
of the book, I think, the point of the book um, about Esther's life, at least that portion of her life. So I want to, to spend some time for a little bit to kind of help us understand what the Bible says about risk. Do you think that being a Christian is risky? Risky. You ever careful about what you say? What you say in front of family members or people at work or, your, or you know, people in your house or, or your friends? Uh, or do, are you careful about the words you use or expressing the things that you hold dearly and the things that you believe in? And if you ever find yourself in that, in light of, of as Charles mentioned, kind of cur current circumstances, right? Uh, that we can be hesitant, that we cannot be willing to be risk takers, uh, even though God clearly shows us, Jesus clearly shows us, and Paul clearly shows us that we must accept the risk of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. You want to go to heaven? Accept the risk involved. You want salvation? Accept the risk involved. You want to walk with Christ? The only way you can walk with Christ is to walk that risky road with Him. Right. And that's the truth. And so there is a risk involved. If it was for Esther, it was for Daniel. And the risk is there for us as well. There is always a risk factor in faith. Always. And you know, when you think about it, <clears throat> there's, there's nothing that we can do that doesn't have some element of risk in it. It seems like everything is risky. Um, Ecclesiastes 10 verses 8 through 9 is a really interesting passage. You know, you, my mind still kind of pulls back to that after we just studied it. Ecclesiastes 10 verses 8 and 9. And when Solomon writes about the, 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 uh, the vain things and the meaningless things in life, you know, he talks about things uh, like, you know, just going out in your life is dangerous, is basically what he's trying to say. In Ecclesiastes 10, 8 and 9, uh, it says, whoever digs a pit may fall into it. So don't dig the pit. I mean, but the point is, there are times when you have to. Whoever breaks through a wall may be bitten by a snake. You know, this reminds me of some people. You ever, you ever saw uh, the, the, the Winnie the Pooh series? You know Eeyore? Eeyore. Oh, man, everything's a problem. Everything's an issue. Karen and I had a friend, her, and forgive me, but her name was Doris. Forgive me if you're named Doris or Noah Doris. But we called Doris Eeyore. Uh, and in love, we loved this one. She's one of the funniest women we have ever known. You'd ask her how her day is. Doris, how's your day? I don't know. It's not, o it's not over yet. What, are you going to be okay, Doris? I hope so, as long as the pills hold out. <laughs> Eeyore. Now here's the, okay, so here's my point. I really had no point. It's just a funny story. Okay. Whoever digs a pit may fall into it. Whoever breaks through a wall may be bitten by a snake. Whoever carries, or quarries rather, quarries stones may be injured by them. Whoever splits logs may be endangered by them. It's just, that's life. There are risks to take. There are risks every day. Driving to work. Driving, just, well, drive, driving around here. There's a risk in being the first person in the intersection here. There's a risk in everything. There's a risk in cheeseburgers. Isn't that the saddest thing you've ever heard? <laughs> Risks are everywhere. Now, with all kidding aside, my friends, we need to see the risk in living a godly, a godly life. And so having faith in God and being a disciple of Jesus is risky. If you take it seriously, if you live it the way the Lord wants you to live it, Jesus was very clear about this risky business. Jesus was clear that being his disciple was going to put you in situations that will challenge you, and it, you risk much by following him. Now I want you to open your Bibles, and I want you to turn to Luke 6. We're going to walk through the book of Luke for a minute. Luke 6, 27. Start there. Luke 6, 27.
Jesus said this, I tell you, but I tell you who hear me, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. If someone strikes you on one cheek, turn to him the other also. If someone takes your cloak, do not stop him from taking your tunic. What's the risk? When you became a Christian, did you, were you made aware? Did you have any idea that when you became a Christian, when you decided, uh, and did you understand that you weren't just becoming a Christian, you were becoming a disciple of Jesus? And that's something that we need to make more clear, I think. But did you understand that you would have enemies? Do you realize that because you're a Christian, you have enemies? Do you realize that there are people who hate you simply because you've named Jesus your Lord? Do you realize the, the, the risk you take in becoming a disciple of Jesus where there are people who will actually curse you and people that will mistreat you, people that will hit you on your face, and people will try to take your clothes, your possessions away? Risk. That's Jesus. Jesus, in the same words, trying to tell people, come, follow me, and this is your life. You know I'm not making this up, right? I know I didn't write this stuff. This is the way of it. We don't think about it. We don't like to think about it. I think maybe we need to start thinking about it a little bit more. Um, it would be wise, I think. Look at uh, chapter 12. Luke 12, 4. It's not my intention to be freaking people out here, but we need to know this stuff. I tell you the truth. I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more. Jesus is saying, don't be afraid. Wow, really? Don't be afraid of that? Really? Really? Oh, that's, a, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a tall order, Lord. Don't be afraid of those who can kill your body, then after that can do no more. Now, there's a lot of good news attached to all this, but that's not my point right now. We just want, I just want you to see the risk involved uh, in walking with Christ. Uh, look at verse 11 now. <coughs> Chapter 12 and verse 11. When you are brought before synagogues, rulers, and authorities, do not worry about how you will defend yourselves or what you will say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. Did you, have you ever, did you ever realize, have you ever found it so? Have you ever experienced that, that, that you may have to stand in front of authority or anybody and have to defend yourself, defend what you believe, defend what you say, defend the, the, the opinions and the, the deeply held um, beliefs that you have, and I've got to defend myself? And part of me says, I don't have to defend myself to anybody. Well, Jesus said I do. And Jesus said I need to be ready for it. To defend myself uh, with politeness, firmness, politeness. Okay, I'm going to stop here. I should just close the Bible. We're getting ugly around here. I don't mean here, I mean around. With what we see, Christians are getting ugly. They are mean, they are not loving, they are not gracious, they are not forgiving. And when I say us, I mean Christians. We need to be Christ-like. We need to be gentle. And I say that with a stern look on my face, and I just, let me smile here. You see what I'm saying? Okay, let's open back up. All right, chapter 21. Chapter 21, verse 12. 21, 12 says, But before all this they will lay hands on you and persecute you. They will deliver you to synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors all on account of my name. And Jesus said, this will result in your being witnesses. Here's your chance to talk. Here's your chance to talk about me. 
talk about Jesus. Look at verse 16. 16 and 17. You will, betray, you will be betrayed even by your parents, brothers, relatives, and friends. And they, your parents, your brothers, your relatives and friends, they will put some of you to death. All men will hate you because of me. There's more good news, but that's not the point yet. All right. Is that, have I made my point? There's your risky Christianity right there. That's the risk that we, that we see. We may not have ever thought about it, because most of the time that kind of stuff is back then or over there. Well, it's not just back then, and it's not just over there, it's right here. And so we need to be risk takers. And faith is a risky proposition. Being a disciple of Jesus can be a risky thing. Paul was very clear about how risky Christianity was. Paul warned Timothy when he served the church in Ephesus. And he told Timothy that all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That's an emphatic statement, meaning this is the way of it, Timothy. This is what's going to happen if you want to be a Christian. And you know what, it, but it reminds me of something. Why in the world would, say, anyone in Rome ever, ever desire or take the risk or assume the risk of being a Christian in Rome? You know, with the Colosseum, with the wild animals being sewn up in a bag and thrown into the Tiberius River and all these things. Why would any of them take the risk of denying the deity of Caesar and calling Jesus Christ the God of heaven and the Savior of the world. Why would they do that? That is amazing to me. Dan, you mentioned in your prayer that we need to have the faith of the people, the ancient people, the people of old, that in spite of persecution, they joyfully accepted that persecution to live with Christ and to go to heaven. That is a prayer that we need to pray on our own all the time. We need that kind of faith. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And verse 35. Romans 8 and verse 35. Listen to Paul. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword, as it is written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Now, I want to give the good news now, because I love it. In all this, no, in all this, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. With every risk there is a blessing. That's why the Romans can do it. And that's why we need to be able to do it. And that's why we need to be sure that we're going to do it. You need to start thinking, my friends, I knew, I do and you do, about how you are going to answer when someone simply asks you your opinion. My Bible class this morning, there's, there's a huge group of people that they were told, when someone asks you your opinion on a biblical matter, it's a, it's a group that I, I don't have much in common with, but it's still, the, the, the situation is still true. They said, we have been ordered not to talk about it. My friends, we have been ordered by the Son of God to talk about everything. What are you going to say? When you're the, the, the questions, the trick questions, the, the people wanting to know, if they know you're a Christian and they know that you're a Bible believer, they know who you are, you're going to be asked these questions. Your answer may not be accepted. Your answer may be tattled. Tattle, you know, told, you know tattle. Yeah, what am I saying? All right. How would we do in Rome? 
I read another uh, a blog. It's one that I like a lot. It's a blog called Desiring God. It's a lot of really good stuff, you know, uh, mostly. But in this, uh, in this blog, Desiring God, a man named John Piper, uh, he said something that I never considered, ever. I don't know why I never considered it, because it's so glaringly true. He asked the question, basically, have you noticed how many people in the Bible were risk takers? In the Bible, the one you have in your lap, the one you read, uh, have you ever noticed how many people were risk takers in their life with God? Willingly risk, uh, risk takers. And some even that were kind of, it was forced upon them, but they took the risk anyway. But they were risk takers. I never looked at it that way, but the Bible is filled with risk takers. I'm reminded of, of what happened in 2 Samuel chapter 10. Joab... Uh, you know, who led uh, the armies uh, of David. Joab faced two armies at the same time. And, and when it started to get going, he said, or before it started to get going, he said to his brother, let us be courageous for our people. May the Lord do what seems good to him. He was going to go out and be divided and fight two armies. And whatever happens, happens. God be praised. It's God's will. Now there's you a risk taker. He's going to go fight him anyway. No, I think we should reconsider. No, he went to battle. A risk taker. I'm thinking of three young men. Daniel chapter 3, uh, Shadrach and his friends refused to bow down to the king's idol. And anyone who did not bow down, when you heard the music play, if you didn't stop and bow down to, uh, to this pagan idol, you would be thrown into the fire thrown into a, into a furnace of fire. But what these men said was amazing. Our, they, they answered back, Our God whom we serve is able to deliver us. Then said, We will not, bow, or we will not serve your gods. Into the fire. The Lord saved them. Acts chapter 20, let's read this one. Let me use Ben and Lauren for a second. Can you imagine how they would feel if I just said, hey, guys, don't go. I feel something bad could happen to you. Did you hear about what happened here on Facebook? They're, they, they, just, they just got on the freeway and an 18-wheeler crashed right in front of them. Ben jumped out of the van and went and helped the man get out of his turned-over semi-truck on the freeway. Ben, you ever seen him? And the guy's like a, uh, he's a spider monkey, man. He just climbs up and, and helps the guy get down. Amazing. If you, ever told, if you were ever told, don't go there. I think something bad can happen. What do you do? Do you consider it? Or you go, you read the news reports. I don't know about going there. You know, like when our kids go to Mexico or, or Don Eva going to Africa or, you know, people uh, that we know that go to dangerous places. What type of faith do we need if we're going to be risk-taking, risk-taking people? Acts chapter 20, verse, starting in verse 22, Paul, it, it, it's a, uh, about Paul. He's talking to the, the, uh, the elders of the church in Ephesus. He says, and now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. Listen to this. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. I don't care. As long as I can do what God wants me to do, I'll, I'll accept the risk. He accepted the risk. Did it catch up with him? Yeah, eventually it did. It caught up with him. But you can see a risk taker. The man just risked everything for the sake of Christ and for the sake of the lost. It makes our issues and the things we consider risky nothing. They pale in comparison to what the first century brothers and sisters went through. That my faith could only be 10% 
of those people back then. It's, their, their faith is so astounding. Now, do I even have to mention more gutsy, risky people, risk takers? What about Peter? What about the risky things that Peter did? Peter walked on the water. Peter tried to kill a man named Malchus with a sword trying to protect Jesus. Peter showed up at the trial of Jesus. He kind of blew that one, but he still showed up. He refused to stop preaching about Jesus when he was threatened never to preach in this name ever again. And we, we heard that situation read to us by Todd. And Peter, going to a Gentile's house, eating with a Gentile and his Gentile family, and shared the gospel with him. And when he went home, the Christians ripped him. This man risked his reputation to bring the gospel to the Gentiles in answer to the instructions by the Holy Spirit, I might add, right? And so he risked his reputation. He constantly risked his life. So here's the thing. I'm going to use the method that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, Mr. York used. At the very end, make sure whatever you teach, how does it apply to you today? That's what I want to leave you with. How do we make this work for us today? How do we be risk takers? How can we be willing to have a faith like that? First of all, it's clear, very clear, biblically speaking now, that being a true and serious and vocal Bible believer is a risky proposition in our society now. Before it was just, you're just a Bible thumper. Or you're one of those Church of Christers, yeah, y'all, the only ones that think they're going to heaven. It's like cliches, they're meaningless and, and ridiculous. But whatever. But no more. That's kindergarten. That's child's play. Speaking a biblical truth can and just might get us into trouble. I told, I've told the elders this, kind of half joking, but brothers kind of really not joking. We need to, when, on Sundays when we pass in the Bible class for the special little gifts of Van Fun and, and Becky and others, we need a preacher get out of jail fund. You know, you know, could that happen? Standing up, if you stand up for biblical marriage, if you make stands for sexual morality, if you stand up for unborn human life, you can get into trouble where you work and in your community, also with your parents, your family, your brothers and sisters, your children. You can get yourself into trouble. But this is what Jesus, and this is what Paul said as well. Jesus taught us, my friends, that whatever risk we have to take and whatever we might have to give up to be his disciple can never compare with what we stand to gain. Do you believe that? That no matter what you risk, no matter what you give up, he will give you 10,000 times more in glory and in blessings if we will take the risks and be an, an outspoken, vocal, loving, kind, meek, and gentle Christian as Jesus was a Messiah. We need to be that way. Paul said the same thing, by the way. Listen to what Jesus said. Just listen to this. If any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your old selfish ways and take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. Paul said, I fully expect and hope that I will never be ashamed but that I will continue to be bold for Christ as I have been in the past. And I trust that my life will bring honor to Christ, whether I live or die. For to me, living means living for Christ, and dying is even better. I love those words. So, risking, let me tie it into Esther. Risking everything for the good of people is the context of Esther. That's what the book is about. It's not about God. It is about her desire to save her people. 
We can, we can conclude that has to do with faith, uh, that God can make all that work out. And I think now we can better understand those profound words that, that Stephen read to us a little bit ago. In Esther 4, verse 16, as she started to realize what she had to do to save her people from death, she said, if I perish, I perish. She was willing to take the risk. So if you are a Christian and you need the encouragement to be a risk taker, I'll encourage you. But when I encourage you to be a risk taker, would you please encourage me to be a risk taker too? If, uh, if you are contemplating a walk with Christ and you don't think you're up for it, uh, you know what? By faith in the Holy Spirit and the Word and the brothers and sisters, yeah, you can do it. We need to do it together though. Uh, with that beautiful Christian, genuine smile. That's the way we'll do it. Let's stand and sing.